Well, good evening, everyone. Thanks very much uh, for traveling so far to be yeah. here uh, with these rather wonderful poets. Yeah, welcome. We're, we're going to um, the, read for, the well, the first section will be the highly commended poets in our book and pamphlet competition. Um, and I'll tell you the, the running order for those poets. And we're going to start with Ramona Herdman, then Mary Allen, Clementine Burnley, Michael Grevy, Lydia Harris, and Lauren O'Donovan. These are poets that were chosen uh, by Hannah Lowe, as you know, like the perspicacious, as she's known, uh, Judge Hannah Lowe last year. We were delighted with these highly commended poets who we were featuring. They're currently, half of them, I think, are on our East of the North. If you go to our website, East of the North, which is just to the slightly to the right of the North, well, Politically, it's very much to the left of the um, the poetry business's North magazine, and uh, there you'll see some of their work. In the next couple of weeks, we're releasing um, the material uh, in stages. In the next couple of weeks, you'll you'll be able to see the the rest of the um, the six highly commended poets, um, and they will then appear in the print edition of the North in April, alongside uh, the two winners, uh, Laurie Volger and Doreen Gurry, who uh, will be taking the second half of this uh, reading tonight and we'll introduce them separately. Is there anything else we need to say? No. Except no, we're no. really glad that these people, the, these rather special poets, have turned out yeah. tonight uh, to read for us and that we're very glad that the, inter the, 23, the 2023 International Book and Pamphlet Competition, judged by Hannah Lowe, uh, saw fit to um, commend these uh, extraordinary writers. And we're going to hear them in the order that uh, okay, Anne so said. So with Ramona. Yeah. There you are. Ready? Thank and you. Now, now, Ramona, we're going to disappear for a bit and um, hear you read. We're looking forward to it. Lovely. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we've all been asked to say where we're reading from. Uh, so I live in Norwich and all my poems uh, from the manuscript that was highly commended are about my experience with uh, having long COVID. The year my body said no. I was shocked. All those years of steady service, and now it lies down in the road like a delivery of coal. I didn't have a language for it. It never explained. It shut its eye like a mammoth sighing. It withheld itself. I realized that everything had been carried on its back. Now I am my body's assistant. I decline invitations on its behalf. I worry about sunlight and airflow. I feed it delicacies, flat on the palm of my trembling hand. It doesn't acknowledge me, but it walks a bit now, stately, some days. Um, long COVID affects people uh, mentally as well as physically. So the term that gets used is brain fog, which really means difficulty concentrating, difficulty remembering things, analyzing things, solving problems, making decisions. Brain fog, not me. Some people are born with brains as calm as amber, calm as drifting down a river in a rowboat all summer. But mine's always been a hustle-bustle brain, rushing in its Macintosh through the sloshing rain. It tusks and sighs and clucks at my lolling body. It wants rolling progress, inexorable and steady. It wants personal bests and beast achievements. It does its lists and expects exact obedience. Its worst horror is its own failure. How it runs headlong, fog-bound now into the railings. Blankly, solidly, printer error stuck, it whips itself on through its own substandardness. It can't do what it did. It can't see what it meant. It knows it doesn't. It's dazed in its astonishment. 
Um, the next poem, I've written a few poems about kind of engaging with the medical establishment um, and uh, research on long COVID has come on a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, but generally speaking, any of the tests that you can get at your GPs do not pick up any of the things that are wrong with long COVID, uh, which is quite a quite a frustrating experience. Again, my test results have come back normal. Again, my test results have come back normal. A normal person would be grateful, thankful. So I smile as if I take as gospel the latest set of test results so normal that it would be, arguably, immoral to wobble, to take up precious professional time with the insufferable rehearsal of symptoms that stay stubbornly abnormal. There's no way I'm a winner in that quarrel. It's just me, only normal against a choral blast of stats and tests and all the medical immortal expertise of centuries. I'm cordial, feel charnel. They offer CBT, should I be mournful? And it's not as if it's something quite as awful as all the things the tests rule out. I should be cheerful. I am resourceful. Life is long. This is but a short lull. Many people in this bind, they say, get back to normal. Um, and uh, this is my last poem, so I'd just like to say uh, thank you to the poetry business for this. And um, I'm very pleased that Hannah Lowe uh, commended the manuscript. Cocktail first. For the first 12 weeks, I bargained. No caffeine, no alcohol just vegetables for getting well. The void didn't keep its side of the bargain. So now I say, fuck it. I'm not missing out on the thrills I like forever in the hope that one year this body will climb out of its damage. Yes, I will have a cocktail. Yes, I will, thank you. Take the known consequences, but cocktail first. Thank you, Ramona. Thank you very much. And now we're going to hear from Mary Allen. Sorry, Mary, you're on mute. Hello, can I be heard now? Yes. Hello, so um, just saying thank you very much to everybody. It's great to be here. Um, my poems are from a, a pamphlet I've written called Gladiator, which is about my time at the Royal Opera House. 25 years ago, I was chief executive of the Royal Opera House and on my fifth day, I discovered it was spectacularly bankrupt. And these are some of the things I wrote as part of my response to that experience. And the first one is called Starting pistol. Empty space shivers above the fence. An opera house haunts the building site, uncertain hallucination. The auditorium skeleton broods over the gap, wings of a damaged angel. Ghosts of singers and dancers cluster outside, gibbering warnings of approaching calamity. Inside the lightless corridor, ballet shoes tumble from a cupboard. Scarlet opera programmes wander across the floor. Four velvet seats wait for an audience which will never arrive. Out of the dusk, I climb a spiral staircase into an enormous office. Chilly air from Longacre filtrates through an open window. I shut it. The room crouches around me. How long will I stay? My predecessor lasted five months. How soon can the office shake itself free of me? Two gray metal filing cabinets sit along one wall. One shudders, a drawer falls open, a folder jumps out. I shut the drawer, but it shoves out again, files slithering inside, papers jostling, arguing, fighting, falling in every direction. I grab one, 
open it. Columns of figures cascade down yellowing paper, budgets, money, losing track of it. I put the papers in order, start to read. The next poem is called Ariadne, for a reason which near the end will become apparent. Ariadne. I'm walking around in a cloud of unknowing. A decision flits across my path, too quickly to grab it. Untaken decisions are bats hanging from the ceiling. I stub my toes against decisions taken years ago, distorted with age, grown out of shape. Who decides which operas and ballets we put on? Names and roles scurry across the floor, different versions of different stories. Visions crowd behind closed doors, out of sight. I find the end of Ariadne's thread, follow it into the dark. Outside, I turn round. The house lurches from the shadows, starting to collapse. Bricks, concrete, marble, smashing into a vacuum. My third poem is called Massacre. I walk along, uh, sorry, I'll start again. I walk down a long flight of stairs into the basement and a labyrinth of storerooms. A plumpish man is sitting on a stool. Hi, I'm Mary. I know, I'm Rob. He shows me swords, spears, pikes, guns. Some of the swords are Napoleonic. There are enough weapons down here for a massacre. I must remember the way back. Prepare for the next board meeting. Gladiator. Last night, our billionaire donor came to my office. Our dissolution would be half his life evaporating. Now flames crackle at the entrance to Floral Street. People shriek past to escape the inferno. Smoke ghosts past my windows. Burned air shimmers in the heat. I need my billionaire. His office says he's gone to the National Theatre. Could I race through the crowds, barge between queues streaming into the auditorium, sprint down the aisle, find the steps to the stage, scramble up, face a couple of thousand people and scream his name? A Roman amphitheatre, audience is baying for blood and I'm the gladiator on my knees, begging to be spared. Finale. I tear up my resignation letter. I'll do as my father suggests. I see a lawyer. When I phone the chairman, he's dismissive. No, we can't talk about my position at tomorrow's board meeting. Yes, we will. At the end then. No, at the beginning. It will be the first thing we do. The meeting starts. I stand. Tell the board my vision for the Opera House, my passion for its work, my admiration for its staff. Then I turn to the chairman. I am brandishing a lit torch above my head, placing it at my feet, where my future career walks on from the present. I tell the chairman in detail what I think of him. I am watching my career burn, an inferno of potential and possibility, scorching into nothingness. I tell the board to choose between their chairman and their chief executive. Choose your chairman. I walk out, fire blazing around me. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Really wonderful reading, thank you. And now, Clementine. Thank you. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I was so pleased to be chosen. Um, so I wanted to say my thanks all the way up front in case I forget to say them at the end. Um, thank you to the poetry business. Thank you to Hannah Lowe. And um, the poems I've written, I've noticed something about them is they're very rarely about um, an individual. They seem to come sort of as clusters of creatures 
as groups. And in this case, mostly I'm writing about creatures in, um, in motion, um, most of them around water. So the first one that I'm going to read um, is called uh, Entanglements. And that's about, that's about rivers, two rivers. Um, oh, and I forgot to say, I'm in Edinburgh most of the time, but I happen to be on the edge of the sea on the coast of um, East Africa by the Indian Ocean this time. Um, entanglements. Mosi Watunya is thunder. And on the D, salmon rise together. Two native born currents yoked by royal command. Mountains are a still point. Mosi Watunya is a witch's brew of smoke, sound, and light. One river needs salt. Mosi Watunya is a disco bauble, a bubbling cauldron, a cure for double shifts and cash remittances. Mosi Watunya dies where Nile perch tunnel, the harbored silences of a stately lake. A river's mouth is where it breaks. The second poem I'm going to read is called Love in Extra Time. You live underneath a major flight path. You have never seen the Pacific. From your neighborhood near Schiphol, you can see the landing gear deploy. The aircraft engines sing like humpback whales. You have never seen the need for travel papers. Elsewhere, the hurricane's eye expands. In Ertatale, the earth cracks open its thousand mouths. On New Year's Eve in Bib, 5,000 red-winged blackbirds fall from the sky. The television say, only small islands grow nervous at every slight rise in the surf. This season feels like regret on the skin. Elsewhere, border forces merge with the police. At the garden's edge, giant hogweed encroach the silvery stems of globe thistle. A sprinkler wets newly sown tomato seeds. We spend more time outside on longer days, we walk on the dikes. The third poem I'm going to read is called Sea Things. The most beautiful things are held inside. When the pearls harvested, the oyster sometimes survives. The end goal of a thing can be itself. The death of crustaceans can be grieved in the same way as the demise of mammals. You girls ask the wrong questions, my fathers say. A special breed of triangle mollusk can hold up to 30 pearls. How many are killed in the wild? They carefully open the shell. If the pearl is a good one, the oyster's left to produce another. From every muscle, shell and spat, nothing's wasted. And my last poem is called Transit. We gave each other new, useful names, made bootleg baptistries. The kitchen sink became an outline shrine, a soapy thumb could daub a cross. We cast the syllables like dice. We were generous, each chose three or four last names, maps of another country, each name, inked onto an official papers, another life measured out in scanty portions. Each syllable, a search for another child. Each child, a return to azure. So many of them turned to water. We left the solid earth behind, took its words with us, bolo, njakri, mula, carried in our mouth, confident as coins, to cross the palms of foreign officials. Thank you so much. Sorry, he's hit again. Oh, sorry. Oh, we, we were mute, obviously. We did. That was my fault. We did the classic 
thing. Someone's got to do it. Uh, yeah, thank you very much, Clementine. And now we're going to hear from Michael Grevy. Cheating for beginners. Drive, no words, you know the way. That burn beyond the bend, go on alone, the moon and you, tell the open ground, pretend it isn't wrong. These sheets, your stain and mine, still warm this glass of wine, unwed me hard and long. Say, don't say what we both know. Slip off his name and hide this stolen hour in other lives. Our toe dabs on the stones. Where rain spells something old. Where all the trees lean in. Swerve that question in the road. Risk the dark again. Rowing your voice to Lydia. Throw. And in the letting go, you are three fishermen. One unspooling, paying line. Another, older, letting it run. Watch your breath careen, moth across the car park. For a room lit dim like this, dark glass somewhere else. Find yourself behind the ear, the lobe, the listened for. Wide-eyed. Downstream, a child again, sitting on the bait box, hands cupped for the catch. The boy who kept bees. Smoke him out. Amber-eyed, dancing the map in his head. Mad, no swarm to his name. Some say a smitten queen slit a slat in the hive, hot for the crack in his smile. And he lay his tongue beneath a strange pink flower. Sever and lift, warm to his wish. Spoon it out of the dark. A honeycomb heart, pottled with holes. Midas coming to rest. Her highness snug up another boy's sleeve. Trying to fly, dreaming of bees. Family tree for everybody's granddad. I climb the warm familiar whiskey of his laugh. Cannot see his top for fog so blue and blowable. Higher now he's whispering, stubble, scuffing all my toes. I sit in my childhood sky. As I grow taller, bolder, that tree seems smaller, older. Winter found him on his side. The proud wood cold. The old shade gone. 
something in the grain. One ring on my grand's held hand hugs the bone, the blood, the vein. The nest. Late fall, we hack the arbour down. A twig swish, moss stitch, cross hatch in the hedge. Fledged to let no eggs. You cup it close, as if to know a hearth or breast, a crash. I keep the parts. A barren heart, wish and ache was tenancy. Wattle cracks, things on the thatch. A cold gets in, the flutter gone. Some nights we grail our hands, Baptists. Seeking water, beggars in the emptiness. My last one, the Beth. Safety last. Sometimes I dream of falling headlong through my breath. Down rabbit holes, the Reichenbach, big top circus air, a cliff edge, ledge or rickety bridge, from grace on soft wax wings, then wake before the thud, splosh, cartoon cloud of dust. Ask that boy in the burning tower, tell a tear of rain, better to be Harold Lloyd, tumble mid-air, grab the hour, hang, straw hat slipping like your thumbs, soft shoes, Dancing trams, all that life below you. Breathe, take in the view, cling to hope, precarious, but laugh, it's good for you. Thank you, Michael very much. And now we have Lydia Harris. It's so, it's such a beautiful thing to be amidst all this beautiful poetry. Um, so thank you. Um, and I'm, I'm north of north. I'm in Westry, which is one of Orkney's North Isles. And the poems in my manuscript were all about a tiny island that I can see from my study, except it's dark now. Um, and there's archeological evidence that there was a medieval chapel on this tiny island. And then there's folk memory that there were seven sisters buried there. This house. This house was found when the tide drew back. This house was drift and float. This house paused at my feet, tilted and lay. Strand of a house, fierce face of a house, head above water on the curving drift south. Sea rolled this house, the size of a heart. This house, a book of words in all tongues, 
The walls of this house are water, its heart fire. This house's eyes are slivers of quartz. This house pled to be saved. This house slept in its curves, hid in its shadows. This house is a house unto itself. And I found it, heard it click as it dried and creak when the hinges swung back. This house will grow. I can carry this house. The home of Achaeus remembers women said to be buried there. On my three islet straggle, see my little chapel, seven tombs in the chancel, seven loaves sleeping, wrapped in seven summers, braced for winter, caused from danger, from the swirling waters at low tide, hear the sisters singing as they spin, pulling threads like moorings to the tiny harbour, swimming on the high tide, pale in the sea's light, casting salty droplets, beads for the telling, hair looped on distaffs, of their necks and bodies, arms free as windmills, grinding the barley, new robed for Compline, lit by whale oil, one by one they enter their stone-built prayer house, bow to their mother, their hearts sing the Psalter, praise to the home haven, praise the mantling ocean. The wind in the chapel made of wrens, a jolt in your ear, quick as a silver bell, a ruffle of down on your top lip, the ripple of a thousand, thousand heartbeats, droplets of blinks from those polished eyes, nips from the tips of the dear, good beaks. Sigh after sigh, spirit of ache, spirit of breast down, hide me says the wind, hide us, reply the wrens. In the margin of my psalter, a rabbit leaps golden and rushes for cover. Amen, in the name of the Father. Larks loop the corners, spiral the sky in the name of the sun, O oh, shrive me. March marigolds, marsh marigolds, tilt their faces to the sun, gaze back with the eyes of Mary. To the spirit I breathe, have mercy. There's a blank space for my name. May air about me, no harm or bluster. It's Compline, I swing west. See how the cross on this page measures Christ's inches. And the final poem. Is this the place? She dragged the boat and left it, pulled the mantle and pinned it, spoke out loud to the wind, took ten steps and turned, called louder than three ravens, penned footsteps in the Psalter, her pages rarely numbered. She wrote what the Spirit told her. Thank you. <laughs> no. It's okay. No, it's okay. Yeah, thank you, Lydia. We're laughing because you know we're fumbling with the uh, unmute yourself, all of all of those um, classic things, and really lovely. And finally, among our highly commended uh, poets, uh, all the way from who's been waiting very patiently in Cork all evening, Lauren O'Donovan.
Thanks so much. I'm so honoured and just delighted to be here. I'm so grateful to Hannah Lowe for selecting my pamphlet and to everyone at the Poetry Business who has just been so kind and so welcoming and just phenomenal to work with. And um, as you said there, I'm calling it from Cork, Ireland. I just want to read a few poems from the pamphlet um, on the theme of motherhood and some of my experiences of uh, some of the highs, which there are many, and uh, the lows, which unfortunately there are also many. The day you were born. We drove along the harbour road where snow fell as softly as a million feathers molted by a god bird. I hadn't slept in two days. Labour was slow and I was high on the hormones of birth. The sleeping city looked small and new, swaddled in still ripples of white. Our headlights illuminated each flake as if the sky had shed a path of frozen stars for us to follow. I wish I could be back in that moment, gliding through a niveous haze intoxicated with the promise of you, about to see your face for the first time, bring you to my inexperienced breast. And I don't remember much else until you were naked and wet on my chest, your skin streaked white with vernix, like feathers oiled from the egg. And I couldn't stop crying and laughing, laughing, and crying. Ingredients. On a tear-soaked floor under rage-splattered walls, I set her down in a thousand square foot glass prison. First, I give her stacking spoons, blue nesting cups, a mixing bowl, sugar, water, flour, butter. She redecorates the kitchen while I make nut bars and bake scones in heart-shaped silicone molds. Then she's two and we're both on the floor, greasing tins, cracking eggs. Her hands are miniatures of mine. Together with one spoon, we stir until she stomps. Me do. I watch her battered, freckled face. Furious with concentration, stirring, pouring, powdering, while my trembling fingers smear clots of dough and broken shells across my face, my neck, my breasts, my bird bone ribs. Involuntary Admission a breast pump stands in the corner of my psychiatric hospital room next to a locked chipboard wardrobe. Somewhere a nurse guards the key along with answers to the questions they keep asking me. What date is it today? The pump is four feet high with long thin tubes wrapped around like limp snakes. One tube mouth rests on the base a plastic starfish on wheels, transplanted from an office chair, looking like any moment the pump will get up, brush its hair, put on a skirt, go to work. It hums, sucking at my shriveled breasts while I nurse its plastic cups. I am a cow in an automated milking shed, except without the swollen udders. Nothing is expressed except a few slow drops, barely bigger than a bead of nectar in a fuchsia flower. Only enough to fill a small spoon, or the seed inside a fat grape, or a pair of those concave hollows contact lenses come in. I give up pumping, sitting on the strange bed that's dressed up in my bedclothes. I think about other tiny things this much milk could fill and wonder how long I've been feeding her nothing. And now my, my last poem for you this evening is a bit more cheerful. It's called And She Flew. With plastic teardrops on soft fingertips, 
We hot glue multicolored craft feathers to a cutout frame. I stick and she snips semi plumes to lay, each slightly longer until it is time for ones washed and dried. Snowy seagull contour and flight feathers we collected together at low tide, along with mottled plumes from the plover. Nearly there, we bend them in a gentle curve to look like the wings of a real bird and use glitter duct tape guided by pencil marks to attach braided straps to map board. She raises one arm up, then the other. Unaware, I fasten wings on my child's shoulders. Thank you. Well done, Lauren. Thank you, Lauren, very much. Okay. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, one of the things that's just occurred to me, uh, everyone, of course, is reading from a pamphlet. Uh, that's that's what's happened. It's just that um, they're all so varied because Hannah Lowe has managed to choose, you know, excellent work by very varied poets who are all writing something quite coherent. That's why it was so entertaining as a reading and so uh, full. But full, we're, we're still wanting leaving is still wanting more, which is lucky because we have the two um, outright winners now. And I'm going to, I get the um, chance to introduce Laurie and then uh, Doreen will be introduced by Anne because that's how we've edited them. Uh, the uh, pamphlets will be available. This is uh, the publication, official publication date is the March of March the 9th, which at the Wordsworth Trust, the celebration there. But the, the if you'd like to pre-order, copies will get to you sooner than that. And um, Pete uh, in the background has put in um, a code for people to order and get the uh, pamphlets, the pre-order post free. And those, I think you'll probably be told this, but it's... Um, B plus P book and pamphlet, you see, B plus P 2023, um, all as one um, uh, block. Yeah. And these rather attractive pamphlets will arrive. Uh, they're almost as attractive as they are good, as you're going to hear now. I'll just say what, uh, before Laurie reads, she'll be leading for longer, of course, than, uh, than the uh, highly commended poets. Hannah Lowe said of Laurie Bolger's collection, these poems of memory and girlhood are powerful evocations of the changing body and the male gaze. A raw, absurdist humour provides a sense of defiance throughout, and the tone is in turns sad, angry and rue. These are extraordinary poems. OK, thank you, Laurie. Thanks, Peter. Oh, my goodness. Everyone's readings like have been so good. I think you're a really good one when you kind of, A, want to write in response to listening to the readings and, two, you kind of forget that you've also got to read. So thank you very much, everybody. And um, thanks for coming, um, all people that are listening in their houses. Um, I think there's something really lovely about um, listening to poetry online. I feel like you don't have to queue for the loo and also you can use your own toilet and um, really take the words in, which I've been doing. So thank you so much. And it's just wherever you are, thank you for coming. Um, I'm in South East London, the, the area with loads of foxes who do not give a monkeys. Um, and I'm going to take... Um, a little bit out of um, Clementine's book and do my um, thank yous first. That was that was very wise. Um, so just before I get going, I just want to thank Anne and Peter massively at the Poetry Business. Um, in my acknowledgements of the book, um, I wrote that I'm constantly moved by the work that you publish and so grateful to be part of an amazing family of poets. Um, thank you for your careful guidance and care with this new work. And I really mean that. So thank you. You've been absolutely amazing. Um, so patient and supportive and brilliant. Um, also, I want to thank um, Hannah Lowe for, for noticing this work and kind of thinking that there was something in it worth publishing. And it's just been such a dream of mine to have the poetry business um, 
you know pick up some of my work for for literally like over a decade so when I got the call for man I was so so happy um and I was actually cooking um in my <laughs> my amazing mentor's kitchen at the time which was the best place to be um so I want to say thank you to Caroline Bird and also Andrew McMillan who have helped me like beyond belief with these kind of poems and obviously several others as well that that didn't quite make the pamphlet but um but will be will be published elsewhere so the pamphlet is called spin um and it's really a kind of strange um tumble dryer as Caroline described it of of poems so you're almost put through a spin wash um but a lot of the poems are set on a spin bike which is um kind of random in a gym and they kind of go um here there and everywhere and come back to this idea of of being on a spin bike in the gym and kind of pedaling and not really going anywhere um so the first poem I'm going to read is called after class and it's a poem that's set in the changing room and it's one of those poems that I think it's just I'm just really excited to read it because it's so weird but also um it's a shout out to the the cleaners <laughs> in the gym um who have to put our sweaty sweat towels in buckets and like take them out of the back um and I always have a really good chat with the cleaner and sometimes as a poet um working on your own a lot you don't really um you might not speak to anyone for like a whole day and it might just be the cleaner that you chat to um so this is kind of for them I guess and it's uh when I lock myself out of my locker uh which isn't the title it's called after class um and the cleaner has to open the locker slyly and go what's inside and then when you prove it's your locker she'll open it so this is after class she asks what's in your locker then I tell her a bag of gold a snake my dad's shoes, fizzy laces, a deaf chime, one for the road. My whole life in a terrarium, my love written in cellophane, a little lifeguard on a tall, tall chair in her chest, a spilt latte, a vanilla Christmas, my mum's heart, a great octopus of a thing that was inked so we could see what was going on with it. Oh, and my heart in the back and a scarf in a bag like everyone else's scarf, a football pitch, his cup of soup, Cheat roll, polystyrene, black coat. Every hallway I've found myself in, a lost pigeon, a baby sneeze, some lentil bolognese and sequins on a trapeze. All the lessons I've learned on sex and my nan's first pay packet, a stained penny. Oh, and my breath, the same in the back. Only joking, I go, just some Air Max, a reusable coffee cup, my purse and a backpack, all the things we hold things with. And beautifully bold, she opens it. So the second poem I want to read is dedicated to my sister. Um, a lot of the poems in the book are dedicated to kind of women in my family. They're in the background of the set. You know, when I'm on the spin bike, I'm thinking of, of generations of women who, um, well, you'll see in this poem, who held up whole houses um, and this kind of resilience of them but this is definitely for my sister who's uh, tuning in from Cornwall and, uh, and she's just bossing it. And this is us in the garden as kids. It's called yoga. I think of us two showing off like the sun shone out of us, lifting your whole body on my feet. No, Gem, look, look at me. And then suddenly we'd connect and then we'd be still. And later we'd be waitresses holding boards of little plates and expensive bowls and heavy trays. We'd hold up grown men and hold up whole houses. So in that icy studio where nobody looked over and not knowing what to do with the block or the strap, I imagine the mat as that patch of summer grass, you holding the dog so she didn't get squashed and me wobbling and kicking one leg to meet the other and you shouting, nearly, nearly, yes, you've got it, go on. So there's lots of poems in the book about exercise. Um, I've got this amazing instructor at the gym that I go to called Georgia, um, and she's got a massive shout out in the back. I almost thought to dedicate the book to her, but <laughs> maybe that was a maybe I should have done that. But this is definitely um, for Georgia, who kind of got me into a fitness space that I just didn't feel like I belonged in for loads of reasons. Um, and I tried boxing one one time, and I absolutely loved it. And I think you 
go through different phases of needing different kind of movement for your body and then sometimes none at all but anyway this was when I was boxing and kind of getting everything out um and this bag um I found out that I was hitting was actually filled with water which was like really strange so anyway this is called boxer size and it's just a little one I hit a tear-shaped bag and want this to not be about weight, but of course it is. Imagine you're ducking under a washing line. I've done that my whole life. The instructor calls us fighters when the little bell goes. I hug the water and then I fall. Um, so someone's asked me to read this one, so I'm gonna read it. Um, it's one towards the end of the pamphlet. Um, and it's called Mary and John's Ruby Wedding, the Working Men's Club, which I think when me and Peter chatted um, on the on the corner of a South East London street just down there, and there was like parakeets going over and it was very cold and we were chatting through edits and I'd sort of done that thing where I hadn't quite made it home yet. And I remember talking about this poem with him and, and almost didn't put it in the pamphlet, but then he sort of really championed that. And I'm very grateful for for both of you again for looking after me and looking after my work. So um, I don't know, maybe I'll dedicate every poem to someone. Maybe this is for you. Uh, <laughs> so Mary and John's Ruby Wedding, the Working Men's Club. The Elvis tribute insists that they sit in the middle of the dance floor on two chairs like they're on a bus. He sways in cheap flares next to the buffet, Mike Technique, part cruise ship, part drunk. I can't figure out if Mary is loving this or is humouring the whole club song. John's hand, Mary's knee. So Elvis is paid cash, doesn't shake the accent when he says thanks. Glassy eyes, half smile. And when John gets sick and can't get to the bar, he'll shove great notes into my palm. And months later, when John dies, we'll have a do, same club, same Elvis. They'll serve jelly deals, big bellies, stiff lips, and the men will go for the same stories when they feel like crying. And Mary will pay the bakers a fortune for a shield made of icing. She'll sit in a booth at the side of things and everyone will ask how she is, how she is. Insist on buying her a drink when she already has too many to finish. So there's lots of poems in the book about spinning and <laughs> this kind of idea, this central idea of being on a, a spin bike or in a gym. Um, and then there's a couple of random ones. And I realised like, you know, when you put together work, whatever kind of thing you're working with and you realise you've become obsessed with something. And um, I said <laughs> with one of the poets that I work with, I was like, poets love birds, don't they? <laughs> and this poem is called Birds. And I realised there's quite a lot of, um, birds creeping in and out of this pamphlet um, as much as there is um, bicycles and and the idea of spinning um, and lots of domestic things but anyway um, I'm going to read this poem it's about Hindus and how much I hate them and uh, yeah it's called Birds and um, this is originally set in Brighton so oh Mary maybe this is for you um, <laughs> but it's about me having a very bad time on Hindu. Birds on the pier, little girls aren't allowed those headbands. On the pier, those little girls aren't allowed headbands with their names on anymore. How many of us want a palace? A woman takes a photo for her ex. How many phones have been dropped in there? I see myself in the arcade glass all hangover and sad story. I watch the pennies drop and imagine our babies screaming like a seagull. Women pull at dresses in queues for bars they don't want to go into. And the hotel has written for us our room, our floor on cheap pink paper. They've put us on the top floor for safety. I call it the tower. No one laughs. I buy thin cigarettes from a man in a corner shop who pulls away my change when my hand goes to take it. I want to run with my arms stretched out to take these women's faces into my hands and shout, are you not sick of this shit? A seagull eats some sick. A hen pisses by a bin while another keeps watch. They'll be back tomorrow for brunch. Tiny sandwiches and orange juice in flutes. But tonight they'll push the bird bones to their lips. Let the juice leak down their chests like warriors. So I think I've got time for maybe one more. Um, 
I really wanted to end on um, the poem that I'm most scared of in the pamphlet. Um, it's right at the end. And um, it's really strange because I thought this pamphlet, when I put it together, was kind of going to end as kind of a kind of mic drop, swinging the sweat towel around your head, like, yeah, I've done it in the gym, women, yes. And then it ended on this kind of very different tone. Um, and I, but I feel so close to this poem, but I also kind of hate it. And I just think it's worth saying that because, you know, um, yeah, I, I love it, but I also find it very scary so I thought I'd read it um so this is called the things I've tried um and then I'll um hand over um to the final poet of the evening and thank you so much again for coming and for listening and being here it's honestly amazing I I just I can't yeah I can't thank you enough the things I've tried the house got confused it thought it saw you cutting golden apples in the kitchen it kept looking for you to bring in the chicken, red onion, honey, soy sauce, to read magazines like they were the Kama Sutra in a dim puddle of light. And the radio played that ad all the time, the one where you kept saying, we have a laugh though, don't we? I spent so much time fishing grasshoppers out the sink, serenading little bombs on top shelves. I filled a bowl with beans and put them back into the tin. I made a mural of us in the hallway, then I painted over it. I just kept a tiny bit in the corner, just the tip of my shoe and the buckle of your boot. And the letterbox filled itself with postcards saying, P.S. Sometimes I can hear my bones straining under the weight of all these lives I'm not living. And the junk mail was always special offers for aquasorbin and the discount code was always both our names. The house started carving out the best places for romance and the bathroom painted itself green. There was a recipe book, 10 easy meals for when you fail at the fairy tale and your clothes went damp in the drawers. So when I held them to my chest, they soaked through. I wanted to leave the door open like they do in the country. I wanted us to land on chimney pots like those bright little birds. The bed thought it saw you sleeping, your long legs folded like a suitcase. And some nights, the wardrobe was a spaceship. I spent the mornings trying to make it go somewhere. Thank you. Wonderful, Laurie. Thank you so much. <laughs> we said Thank that, you, don't yeah. you? I, you know, it's, it's what we're thinking. Yeah. And, and our last reader of uh, the evening and the other... Our right winner of the competition is Doreen Gurry. Um, I'll, I'll read what Hannah Lowe said. Varied in subject matter, these poems are clearly in the control of a singular voice. There is wonderful use of imagery throughout and surprising metaphor in abundance in gentle and inventive poems that explore ideas of love, home, family and loss. Doreen Gurry. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for letting me share a platform with such incredibly varied voices and, and people. And thank you, Anne and Peter, for incredible workshops, incredible guidance, and Hannah Lowe and uh, my family and poetry friends who hopefully are listening and watching in. And I'm going to start, you know, a coalition of cheaters. It's not about the Tory government. Uh, so I better get the, um, I think I'll read this first. And uh, it's really about my uh, English education at the secondary modern. And um, <clears throat> our English teacher wasn't very expansive or very creative. Um, it was a bit like English lessons, sort of cross between top of the form and where you've got lots of useless information and uh, with a sort of sharp edge of sexism too. Anyway, this is called uh, Vocab and um, that's where the line comes from, the title of the pamphlet. Jock Ellis loved words. Irregular verbs, plurals, antenna, anybody? What about louse? He taught sentence corrections, 
spelling, vocabulary, colonizing our books with neat columns of ticks, all their tails tucked in. Collective nouns were up on the wall, a shrewdness of apes, a coalition of cheetahs, a marvel of unicorns. The female swan is called a pen. You should also know these. Philly, mare, vixen, bitch. Now, three synonyms for lazy. I wrote indolent, apathetic, and for good measure, indifferent. So that when Miss Peacock, the games teacher, crowed, run, you lazy mare, I trotted out my new forged words. Later, I picked up my pen and wrote, tyrant, despot, martinet, feeling my swan's neck stretch, elongate. Grow. Um, the second poem is uh, it's also about the power of words, uh, and it's about my brother and my father. It's called Paternal, and it's about what happens when uh, words get out and become dangerous. And it's also about that generation gap, which was at its widest in the sort of late 60s and 70s. <clears throat> Paternal. Do what you want, you will anyway. So you painted your bedroom khaki, threw down an offcut from the shop that used to be a chapel. Then, with a felt tip filched from school, wrote anti disestablishmentarianism across the pelmet, with a note in brackets at the end, the longest word in the English language. Poems by Wal Soyinka came next, fingerprints across your ceiling. Be ageless as dark peat, run naked into the night. You could read their messages of defiance as you lay in bed, you said. At a loss, father suggested a headboard, talked about piranha pine and polyurethane gloss, spent an age drilling and fixing it to the wall, only for it to fall the night you smuggled your latest past his door. You stupid bastard, was all he could muster. But later I caught him craning his neck to read the ceiling, looking for clues, wondering what it was all about. And um, this um, next poem is also about my brother. <clears throat> and um, before uh, life became a little bit more um, difficult, it's called Dumping Ground. I got rid of your letters, all six of them, in the last move, along with the 49 playing cards the lecture notes with loon pants drawn down the side and the jack-in-the-box who wouldn't come out. Yet I still think when I climb the attic stairs to fetch a suitcase or someone's stringless guitar that I'll find them in the box with the highwayman on the lid and read how your yellow trousers have faded in the wash, how your gas has been cut off again, that you're still wrestling with Kierkegaard. I see them mouldering in some giant refuse tip, refusing to die 
a seam of concentrated life, running like ore through the waste, your inks losing themselves, leaching out into a peacock's plume among the newspapers, discarded clothes, the unwanted, the almost complete. Um, <clears throat> Uh, I've, there are quite a few poems in the collection about uh, women who have relationships with artists. And um, the first one is, is close to home because um, my husband's a sculptor. Um, and then um, there, there are another couple about Gwen Jong and her relationship with Rodin, the, um, the sculptor. This first one's called Rival. When I call in this week, you're carving her hand. The stone falling like hail, pale sandstone you crush underfoot. So when you angle your fishtail chisel to walk it round her little finger, or chase a riffler across her breasts, I know she's always been there. Trapped when seas retreated and now freed by you, who knows exactly what to do to start in on her open mouth or V cut the scales of her tail. I dream her disappearance. One night, after heavy rain, before the last kiss of your chisel brings her to her feet, she gives you the slip, flips down from her plinth as a sea fret rolls in, leaves only a trail of iridescence across the yard and questions asked about the door ajar. And, and um, this next one is um, when John had a sort of passionate affair with Rodin and um, he became, you know, almost like a god to her. She called him master. Um, she wrote letters to him every day. Um, and so her paintings are, have got such sort of quiet rectitude and yet underneath was this um, passionate longing. And so this is an imaginary letter uh, from Gwen to uh, Rodin. And Edgar Quinet is a cat. Letter to Rodin. Please come tomorrow. Ma chambre n'est pas sale. I know I'm a poor spirit, always trying to be loved, not able to speak. I've cleaned all day. I've painted the floor pink. Edgar Quinet eats in the kitchen now and is not allowed on the bed. I was posing for hours. Mrs. Schmidt in the morning, Miss O'Donnell in the afternoon. I have been a machine. My room is lovely after a day outside. It seems that I am not myself except in my room. The books you gave me are by my bed. Soon I'll finish Dante. Come to me tomorrow. I have enough coal for the morning. Au revoir, mon maître. Gwen. I've hurried dreadfully to meet Rodin. He did not come. I have a headache and long for the sea. That's a quote from her um, letters and notebooks. After it was over, you flew straight into the cupped palm of God, praying with the Sisters of Charity for simplicity, a teller of harmonies, a seer of strange beauties, praying at the back of church, drawing the sisters sitting together, their starched cornets like sails or great white birds in flight. Each evening you whispered Compline, 
He shall cover you with his wings, and you shall be safe under his feathers. That last week, you travelled to Dieppe. In your notebook, Bleu outre ombre et nature, shadows of rose noir, April faded pansies on the sands at night. And uh, two more poems and, and um, I'll finish. This one is for my Welsh mother, <coughs> Blodwyn, and um, it's called Hiraith. And Hiraith is a Welsh word for longing, especially for home. She was always in exile, my poor mum. <clears throat> you didn't devote much time to baking. No buns in frilly paper for us, or fruit cakes beset by currants and raisins. No sponge stuccoed in buttercream, flecked with a thousand sugar strands. Such a lot of fuss, you said, which ruled out birthday cakes, flans or pale meringues, not your cup of tea. It was those Saturdays in front of the telly where I guessed your real devotion lay. Barley wine glittering in your glass. Bread of heaven lifted straight from the chapel onto the pitch. And you singing your heart out, praying for whales to win. Uh, and the very last one is... Um, in praise of um, bookshops, bookshops everywhere, um, and it's called Vodkins. And it's based on a, a, a bookshop in York, but it's not called Vodkins in York. Ian Fleming lolls against Catullus, while Teach Yourself Bricklaying props up a school copy of Hard Times. A small phallus enters bottom left. Today, falcons and falconry in Qatar has centre stage, and you're there in your lofty chair, books on your desk, on the floor, books in boxes, books too deep on the shelves, the stairs an extra tread of books. I trip over a bag of knitting patterns, Men in cable jumpers pointing at the horizon, then walk past Geoffrey Boycott and Napoleon to pass time with Mata Hari. Why do I keep coming? Less and less space to move each year. It's not just the rare copies or you growing old with me, but the lives between the pages, from the Odyssey to cycling in Wales, 1954 and you at the centre, giving all your creatures a chance to wing it one more time. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, Doreen, very much. Well, it just remains for us to say thank you to our readers. We're just, you know, infinitely blessed here. So I'll thank, in, in the order that they read, Ramona Herdman, Mary Allen, Clementine Burnley, Michael Grevy, Lydia Harris, Lauren Donovan, and the two pamphlet winners, Laurie Bulger and Doreen Gurry. And thank you. And thank you to everyone who stayed and listened. And I hope really enjoyed the evening as much as we did. If people want to come along to uh, Words with Trust in Grasmere on the March the 9th, it would be great to see you. It's free of charge to come in and uh, you have to pay to go out, obviously. No, but you could buy a pamphlet as you leave or or or, or both. Uh, we hope there'll be some other readers as well as uh, the two uh, main uh, winners, but they're definitely going to be there. I think um, it's... Uh, it's a marvellous thing. And just remind me that uh, this is the 38th year that we've been running this competition. And uh, she's noticed that this, the standard has got higher and higher. Mm -hmm. And and that includes uh, the highly commended poets who eat all of whom might on another day have, uh, have uh, pushed um, Hannah Lowe into allowing uh, all of them.
to um, it used to it used to be a lot easier to um filter this competition and shortlist because you know we we got really really good poems and we got a lot of lots of poems in but now it's just you know it's a, it's a lot harder which is which is a good thing for yeah. it to be really it's and i hope um well, anyway, thank you everyone uh, for reading tonight and I hope everyone at home has enjoyed the reading as much as we have. And um, uh, take care, safe home. And if you know anyone who has missed it, it's on YouTube. People have gone out. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.